This episode is brought to you by FX's Feud, Capote vs. the Swans. Inspired by actual events, the series tells the story of Truman Capote and the women he betrayed. The original housewives, they were society's most elite women, rich, glamorous socialites who defined a bygone era of high society New York. From creator Ryan Murphy, this drama series features an all-star cast, including Naomi Watts, Demi Moore, and Diane Lane. FX's Feud premieres January 31st on FX Stream on Hulu. You've got to let yourself be a beginner or you'll never try anything new. Hi, this is Anita Joyce here with Kelly Wilkness, and this is Decorating Tips and Tricks. Today's episode is an interview with Marion Parsons, and we are so excited to have Marion here with us. And I don't think she needs an introduction, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce her just in case. And she is behind the super popular blog, Miss Mustard Seed. Uh, She began in 2008, and this was just something she was doing on the side, but it's grown into so much more with over 600,000 followers, uh, and she's so talented in so many ways, decorating, selling antiques, refurbishing furniture, creating original art, uh, product and fabric design, freelance writing, photography, a podcast, mentoring other entrepreneurs. I I could just go on and on. She's got a milk paint line called Miss Mustard Scenes Milk Paint that you can get online, and her art has been sold on Hobby Lobby, Creative Co-op, Decor Steals, TJ Maxx, and so much more. So we're so glad to have you here, Marion. Welcome. Thank you. That's quite an introduction, Anita. I appreciate it. (laughs) I have so many questions. I'm excited to chat with you, Anita. I've always really loved your work as well, following you on your blog and what you've been up to. And of course, you've a beautiful book as well. So it's it's awesome to get to speak with you. I've always wanted to know how you got started with your business or your blog. I mean, because this was 2008 when you got started. What made you even decide to start with a blog? Well, I actually didn't start right with a blog. I started my business as a, as a decorative painting and mural business. And that was really because I just, I needed a way to earn some extra money. And I needed it to be something I could do from home. I had a four-month-old and an almost two-year-old. And so working outside of the home was going to be kind of a challenge. And um, so I just needed something I could do from home. And this was... Man, it was crazy. There was like no reason why I should have started a decorative painting and mural (laughs) business. I did not have, you know, extensive experience other than painting as a hobby. And, um, but I just kind of, I've always been someone who's just willing to go for something and give it a try. And my mom was a huge encouragement in it as, and my husband as well. So I started that doing, I did a lot of murals around, I lived near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania at the time. So I did some murals around there and it sort of evolved into more refinishing furniture. I, for a long time, I felt like I had to do decorative painting on everything. And then I'm like, you know, sometimes I just want (laughs) to refinish a piece. So I started, I shifted my focus more to buying and selling furniture and antiques. And then I started the blog after about a year of doing that on really a whim. It was literally like somebody said, hey, you you might want to think about starting a blog. And then one day I'm like, hmm, okay, well, let me see what, what this blog thing is about. And I just looked up home decor blogs and I went to a uh, blogger, you know, which was like the, I think the Google platform for blogs. And I just clicked um, start a blog and I started one and then that was it. <laughs> so did you think of it as an extension of your business or was it just something fun to do on the side? Yeah, I thought of it right from the beginning as an extension of my business. I thought this is a way that I can share what I'm doing with other people. It could be a form of advertising. It could be a form of connecting with potential clients as well as other people who love what I love and do what I do. And I also saw potential in sponsorships and advertising, even though that just really wasn't there were there was advertising for through Google AdSense, but there really wasn't a lot of sponsorship opportunities at that time I got laughed at a lot for (laughs) sending emails asking if people wanted to sponsor my blog (laughs) Um, 
But, you know, eventually it, it just it started to grow and snowball. It felt like a huge waste of time for like six months. Um, <laughs> it does. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> it's a, you're writing to like yourself and your mom and like 10 other people. And, and you just have to I think you have to kind of believe in the process and just keep going. And um, that's what I did. I, I really didn't care if it was successful at that point or not i had just this unshakable faith in it that it was gonna it was gonna go big places <laughs> so i just stuck with it did you have experience with photography at that point so i had taken a photography workshop class um it was just at a local camera shop and it was actually with just SLR cameras. There was, we didn't have digital. Digital mm -hmm. cameras were available, but they were so expensive that they were really out of the price range for an amateur photographer. So I just had a regular film camera and I just, um, we, we would review our photos on slides. Uh, but that's where I learned about like you know, aperture and depth of field and the rule of thirds and all of that kind of stuff that then helped me once I started my blog, it kind of, although it, my photography's grown a lot, I had a lot to learn about shooting interiors and shooting products and that sort of thing. But I just, I just learned as I went, I, I gave myself a lot of grace in the beginning to know that it, I'm not going to be great at everything all the time. I'm not going to be good right away. I'm a beginner and I just need to give myself the grace and let it be what it is. I love what you just said. You gave yourself the grace to just learn. And I think you're so right. And I think that's some, a lesson for all of us. And that is to allow yourself to make mistakes because that is how you, you're going to learn. Yes. Yeah. You've got to let yourself be a beginner or you'll never try anything new. You, you'll always just do what you've always done. And I don't know. That's just that's just no way to live. I think once once we start <laughs> stop growing and being willing to try things and maybe being willing to be foolish or not good at something, then I think we've kind of lost our curiosity in life. Very smart words. So uh, as far as you being an artist, is this something that you're self-taught or did you actually take some lessons in, in painting landscapes and, and the other things that you paint? So I would say I'm book taught and maybe uh, like YouTube and online class taught. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. So not, not formally. Uh, I have looked into a formal art education and I just decided, you know, I just don't I just don't know if that's the route that I really want to go. So I've kind of curated my own art education by I buy a lot of books. I read a lot of books on art, uh, which is wonderful because then I can be taught by a variety of people and have a variety of uh, viewpoints on different techniques and color palettes and all of that. And then I've also taken a lot of online classes. It's kind of like those are my vices <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> books and online classes i'm just always i was just doing um lino cutting for the first time last night uh from an online class so and what is that so you're cutting uh you're carving a drawing into a linoleum block and making a stamp out of it so it can be stamped like into a pattern or you can stamp a, a print off of the linoleum cut. So it's called lino, short for linoleum. So I was just making a lino block last night for the first oh, time. Oh, wow. I always love learning new things. It just, it's kind of what keeps me fed creatively. If I keep doing the same thing over and over again, it gets very kind of boring and tiresome for me. Well, that would explain why you've done so many different things. Right. And I do. I mean, there are things that I've done for years and years and, and I love doing them still. Like I get asked quite frequently, why I don't do furniture anymore? And it's like, well, I do furniture. I just don't do hundreds of pieces of furniture each year. And that's because I did that for about 10 years. And, you know, my back is tired of it. And <laughs> and um, I and I feel like I've kind of conquered that area. And I don't, well, there's always more to learn. I'm not saying that there's nothing more I have to learn in that area, know where I can improve. Um, I feel like I just am ready. I was ready to move on to other areas uh, and challenge myself in other ways creatively than just continue doing furniture over and over again. 
back. So, Marion, how has the blog and creative world changed since you first started back in, I guess, around 2008? Yeah, I so I started my blog actually the summer of 2009. My business was in 2008 and oh gosh. I mean, you know, it's changed so much. Um <laughs> yes. the biggest change has been social media. Um when I started my blog, Facebook didn't have algorithms. It was just a place to kind of connect and share. Um, the good old days. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, so I would share my blog posts on Facebook, uh, but there was no Pinterest. Uh, Instagram was not around. Um, Twitter was just kind of a thing, but not really. I don't know. We didn't do much with it. The way that you connected with other people was from hopping from blog to blog. So we did like link parties and we would have like a private Facebook group to talk among bloggers or among people who followed the blogs. And that was just kind of the way we were connecting. So what that meant was all the traffic was coming to me, to my blog, to see what I was doing. And then once Pinterest and Instagram and Facebook really changed, once Facebook changed the algorithm, it just completely changed from people coming to my blog to I need to be hanging out on those spaces on Instagram and Pinterest and Facebook specifically. Uh, and YouTube is another one, but in order to be able to reach a broader marketplace, it's sort of the the equivalent between selling in your own online shop versus selling as a seller in, um, you know, on an Amazon marketplace or eBay or Etsy. You're mm -hmm. part of this larger group of people where you're able to reach a broader audience. So social media has been really good in that respect. Uh, I have a larger audience on social media collectively than I ever had just on my blog alone. But as a blogger who used to have everybody kind of come to your space, it's it's definitely a dynamic change when now you're the, you're having to kind of go out and invite everyone to to keep coming to your space. Um, and also just sharing on those platforms for the people who just want to interact with you on those platforms because they don't have time to be hopping all over the Internet. Right. And I mean, it really was a golden time back then. There weren't mm -hmm. so many blogs and now it just feels so crowded. It's hard to really find those blogs. It seems like the ones that you're really going to connect with because there's so many. Yeah, there are. I remember we felt like there were a lot at the time, if you're looking back about, you know, seven mm -hmm. or eight years ago, but it's like compared to what it is now. And even that was even really before influencer was a you know, a, a career. <laughs> right. We we were just called bloggers. It was, there was not this influencer thing. And so I think there's been this, I, I've definitely had some like awkward stages, you know, kind of my adolescence of blogging over the, over maybe a five years ago or so where I, I had just had to figure out like, what do I want to do with these new platforms? Which mm -hmm. one am I going to, which one or ones am I going to really embrace? How, how am I going to adapt and change and yet still remain authentic to myself and what I want to do? I remember at one point I said, if, if video, if, if where we're going is like live video all the time, I'm out. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm just not. <laughs> And it's like, that is where we've gone now is like with yes. stories. It says really, it's like live video all the time is kind of where we've gone. And so, you know, I had to, you know, I always laugh at that because I'm like, well, <laughs> I guess I'm not out. I guess I'm willing to, I'm willing to give it a go. So well, I, no hair and makeup for this podcast. So <laughs> right, we can't see each other. Yeah, that's that definitely put a cramp in my style of like just throwing a bandana on and not putting any makeup on. It's kind of held me accountable to <laughs> getting fully, fully ready most days. Well, I, my background is in musical theater, so I grew up um, being kind of a ham. And even though I'm not really, you know, I'm not eager to jump on a stage anymore, I, I, I think I have a comfort level with it. And it helped out early on, I realized as I was doing tutorials on painting furniture and refinishing and making slipcovers and upholstery and all of that, those are very complicated topics to write about on a blog. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, True. I can't, I just, this is going to be so hard for people to follow. Mm -hmm. Even with pictures and descriptions, it's just, a video is going to be so much better. So it was 
probably about 10 years ago now, I started making YouTube videos and and it was very difficult at first. I felt really awkward talking to a camera. And then I kind of had a turning point where I was like, the ca- I'm not talking to a camera. I'm not talking to an electronic device. I'm talking to a friend. Mm-hmm. And so I would just practice that. I would just turn on the camera and just practice talking to the camera as my friend. And so I think having that practice from 10, you know, starting 10 years ago doing YouTube videos has now helped me with doing stories that I need to not talk to my phone, but talk to the people who are, you know, who are watching it. Talk to my friends. I love that. That's another tidbit for us. If you're on video, think of just talking to one person who's a friend. As great as social media is, there's just a lot of baggage that comes along with it that I think that we're just not quite prepared (laughs) to to handle. And so I think you, you really have to figure out how to navigate it in a way that is going to be healthy for you. And that's going to look different for everybody. The fact is, though, if you have an online business, social media is your best marketing tool. Mm -hmm. And it's Mm -hmm. one that you really need to utilize. So some of it is you just have to figure out how to set up those boundaries so you can do it in a way that's effective, but that's not going to, you know, damage you. Hey, we'll be right back with the rest of the show. But keep listening so we can continue bringing you DTT. Pesto pork chops over Parmesan polenta. Not that easy to say, but oh, so easy to make with Green Chef. Green Chef is the number one meal kit company for eating well, and we have such a great deal for you. You're going to save $250. Listen on for the details on that. Green Chef makes eating well easy for any lifestyle, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, or just looking to eat more balanced meals. You know, we're getting into the busy holiday season, so it's a perfect time to have Green Chef help you out. Let Green Chef take the work out of eating clean this holiday season with their chef-crafted, nutritionist-approved recipes featuring fresh ingredients and nothing artificial. And you know what? You don't have to lose track of your healthy eating habits during the holidays. Every Green Chef customer gets a free, that's right, a free session with their registered dietitians who will walk you through how to make clean eating work for you. So sign up for your free session and start on the road towards better health today. And the deal I want to tell you about, visit greenchef.com slash DTT250 and use the code DTT250 for $250 off your order. So that's greenchef.com slash DTT250 and use the code DTT250 for $250 off your order. Green Chef is a delicious delight any time of year, but especially during the holidays. What a wonderful vision to behold at the Green Chef boxes on your doorstep. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. And it makes eating well so easy with plans to fit every lifestyle, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, or just looking to eat a more balanced diet. So let Green Chef take the work out of eating clean this holiday season. And if you've got guests coming, shop Green Bundles. They're now available at the Green Market. It's your one-stop shop for nutritious grab-and-go breakfasts, including vegan options, brunch kits, wholesome lunches, ready-to-eat snacks, veggie sides, and more. You can feel your best this December and do your best with Green Chef because they offset 100% of the delivery emissions as well as 100% of the plastic in every box. Go to greenchef.com slash 60DTT and use the code 60DTT and get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. Greenchef.com slash 60DTT and use the code 6060DTT to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. What tips do you have for someone getting started in a creative business? Oh, man, so many. I mean, I think the biggest thing is to, I, I think the biggest hang up that I hear from people is that they see 
so many people are doing what they want to do or something similar to what they want to do, especially with social media. Now we have a, a window into everybody's studio and workspace and uh, you know, all the stuff that they're doing into their businesses. And I think it's easy to look at all of that collectively and then feel like you don't have anything unique to offer. And that's just not true. Even if, you know, thousands of other people make pottery and you want to make pottery, yours is going to be yours. It's going to have your own signature on it, literally with pottery, your own hand, hand prints and fingerprints on it. So it's, I think you have to embrace what makes you unique and not worry if other people are doing things that are, you know, similar or parallel to what you're doing. And in some respects, you have to just put your blinders on and take that step of faith and do it. Uh, I'm a firm believer in, you know, offering what you do as your creative business, whatever it is, as as a gift to the world. And if it's coming from you, it's uniquely yours. I know it sounds a little, you know, I don't know, romantic and all of that. But but I think it that some people, they just need to get past that, that first step. Some practical things I would say is buy the dot com, get the domain. If you have an idea of a name you want, make sure the, do the domain is available. That's a huge thing. Look up the Instagram handle, Facebook handle, and get that on every social media platform, whether you intend to be on it or not. Get it on TikTok, get it on YouTube, get it everywhere. Because um, in this world where there are so many people with online profiles and all of that and websites, it's important to kind of claim your space on the internet. And um, it, that's getting more challenging. You have to find a name that's really unique. And that is going to push you into some interesting places, I think. So that would be a practical one. And also, even though you're a creative business, don't neglect things like liability insurance, getting an accountant, getting good software to help you keep track of your finances. So some practical side of things as well. Um, but the, at the heart of it, it's you just need to go for it and not feel like there's no room for you because there is there's it's a big world and there's room for you and i think you're right i mean everybody's got a little different take on things and you know two people painting the same scene it's going to look different yes so. exactly exactly so um and i think a lot of people don't go for it because they talk themselves out of it <laughs> before they even get started so don't do that do you think it's the fear of fear of failure too if there is that fear of failure, which of course, I mean, that's a natural thing when you're trying something new. Uh, first of all, you, you're going to have fails. It's just going to happen. So knowing that ahead of time will sort of take that like, will I fail? Won't I fail? You just go into it knowing I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to fail in some areas, but I'm not going to be able to judge if this business was a failure for, you know, years and years. And how do you even, how do you even determine that? So it's important to judge what does success look like? What does failure look like? And, and determine that. So you know what your goal is. So I'd set really low expectations, <laughs> which, <laughs> which I did. I, my goal was like, I wanted to make $200 a month for groceries. That was my goal when I started my business. That's it. $200 a month. So my goal was really, really low. So mm -hmm. success was likely because <laughs> I think, you know, you could somehow eke out $200 and, mm -hmm. And I was able to get to that point and then well beyond it. So set low expectations for yourself so it's not stressful. Um, don't go into debt to start a business. That right away is going to cause stress. And I'd say start where you can start. So I, I did not have any money when I started my business. So starting a decorative painting and mural business made a lot more sense because I didn't need the capital to do it. I didn't need to buy a large inventory to start a shop. I didn't need to rent a space. I, I didn't, I, it could just be me and a brush and paint and that's all it needed to be. And so I think start where you are able to start. Don't try to start where, you know, it's unrealistic. You don't have the money to start there because then it's, that's going to be stressful. And I think, I think that's where a lot of small businesses get in trouble is they kind of overextend themselves right in the beginning. And then they then they can't really enjoy the thing that they, you know, felt called to do because it's stressful. That's excellent advice. 
you moved about four years ago from Pennsylvania to Minnesota. And I'm curious to know how that affected your decorating style and your business. So we had talked about moving for a few months and I'm like, I don't think I'm ready. I don't think I can, you know, I can't leave my studio. I had this wonderful like 2,500 square foot studio um, in this old building and I had so many people who were sourcing antiques for me to sell. I loved selling at a local spring market at Luckett's. I I was a vendor there, but I stopped doing that because I had too many other things going on. I just wasn't ready to leave that area, but it became really clear. I kind of came around and it became clear like it was just time for us to move on. And my husband had a wonderful opportunity um, here at a church in Minnesota. So it just was like, okay. And it all lined up like someone bought our house who we never even had to list it. We just did a direct sale to them because they had always wanted to live on our street specifically and had said, oh, if ever Miss Mustard Seed sells her house, we'd love to buy it. So it just like everything worked out perfectly. And so we ended up moving from a 1940s Cape Cod in a little downtown area to a suburban home that was 13 years old, very beige. Um, It had some nice upgrades and a great floor plan, but it was not this old house that I was looking for. So there were a few things that I had to, well, I think my style has stayed the same. I've had to shift from in this 1940s house, it had smaller rooms, it had lower ceilings. I could use sort of smaller, more primitive pieces. They looked really great in that home. In this home with ceilings that were a foot higher and the rooms are larger, the antiques looked dinky and dirty. <laughs> it's just, so interesting. It's like everything shrank when we moved into this house because just the rooms were so much bigger and the ceilings were so much higher. And so these primitive pieces that I had that I really loved, I ended up selling almost all of them. I think I kept one because it's a taller piece. And I ended up swaying more in the direction of French and European antiques Mm. because those really worked in this house. Mm -hmm. They worked with the lines and the feel of the house. So I had a lot of those pieces already. And then I just kind of added to that. I emphasized that part of my style instead of sort of more the farmhouse look Mm -hmm. because that just didn't work in this house. So I definitely had to kind of um, it wasn't so much I changed my decorating style. I just nudged it a little bit into mm-hmm. a, a different direction. And then for my business, now I went from a 2,500 square foot studio that was outside of my house into uh, my business is spread into sort of three separate rooms. I have a studio that's a sun porch that we converted into a studio. We finished it and put a mini split in it so it'd be climate controlled. It's really pretty. It's really a very fun looking space. It is. It's wonderful. I love my studio. It's just my happy place. It's it's um, and it's wonderful that it is a converted sun porch because it has an exterior door. So it's very quiet and soundproof in here. So I have that. And then I have an office that was a home office. So I just use that as my office. That's where I do my writing and um, all my not fun business work that you have to do (laughs) when you own a business. I don't do that in my studio because my studio has got to be for my creative stuff. And then um, we have an extra, we're just fortunate enough to have an extra bedroom. It's just a small room, but I use that as a sewing room. So that's where I can keep all my upholstery supplies and my sewing machines and and all of that because it's kind of bulky, you know, bulky gear. Um, so I have that sewing room as well. So I'm sort of spread out, but it it we did buy a house that would be able to accommodate my business because that was, you know, that was important. I was still going to be doing my work here. Although, as I mentioned, I'm not doing hundreds of pieces of furniture each year anymore. And a part of that is space. Uh, I don't, we just have a garage, so I can't, well, I guess I could take over the garage, but I'm not going to. And um, and then also just, you know, finding new sources and places to sell. This is just, Pennsylvania was so rich with all mm-hmm. of that stuff. And this area, you can find some good things, but it's not quite as um, as plentiful or as inexpensive as it was in Pennsylvania. So 
yeah, so I've had to kind of make make some adjustments, but it was all of those were changes that I was really ready for. I was kind of ready to work back out of the home again, not have such a large space outside the home, you know, paying rent on and internet and all that. I was kind of ready for that. And I was ready to take a step out of furniture, as I said. So the, the move suited us, definitely. And maybe that was a good excuse to stop doing the furniture in a nice clean break. It was. It really was a good time to reassess my business and be like, okay, what do I love? What do I want to keep? What do I want to change? How do I want to reinvent myself? And it was actually just, um, I think, two or three months after we moved that I started oil painting. And I think this studio just sort of was like, I, I'm not a furniture studio. I'm an art studio. Mm, <laughs> and so mm -hmm. it just yes. kind of pushed me in that direction. And I just sort of, I took on a, a challenge that one of my friends on Instagram set out for herself to paint 100 landscapes. And I just said, I'll do it with you. I'll do it too. And so I painted 100 landscapes in oil and I was, I was hooked. That makes me tired just saying that <laughs> or hearing it. <laughs> Well, you know, it was the best teacher. Repetition really is the best teacher. I mean, and that's true of anything. If you want to be good at playing violin, you've got to play scales over and over and over again. If you want to be a good tennis player, you got to hit, you know, millions of balls uh, to be a good tennis player. So, you know, if I want to be an artist, the best way to be an artist is to create art and do it over and over and over and over and over again. And that repetition really helped me it taught me more than the books could teach me, more than classes could teach me. And mm -hmm. um, while all those are great, nothing's going to replace just doing it over and over again. I think you're right. Doing it, that's how you're going to learn more so than reading or listening to someone talk. So yep. I think you're onto something there. <laughs> so speaking of being creative and artistic, I'm interested to hear about your podcast with Shauna West, The Creative Exponent. Shauna and I have been friends since you and I were talking before we started recording about Haven, mm -hmm. at, mm -hmm. which is a home bloggers conference in Atlanta. And uh, we met at a bloggers conference uh, called Blistum way back. I don't, it must be like 11 I remember that. years ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. And we met there. We both did furniture at the time and we just had a lot in common. It was one of those things where it's like, oh my gosh, I just met like my twin. Like we're just <laughs> so much in common. And so we, we became really good friends. We spoke on the phone and, and did a lot of things through the blog world together. We were um, co-keynote speakers at Haven one year. And oh, I was there that year. Yeah, yeah. It, was great. Yes, oh, it, was it was so wonderful. fun. So we've just become wonderful friends. And we would often have conversations about creativity and about just kind of this conversation that we're having here about like the blog world and starting mm -hmm. a creative business. And so as we were talking, even when we were at Haven speaking together, we said, oh, we should do a podcast together. That would just be really fun. We can, it gives us an excuse to talk together every week and we can record it and share it with other people. So that's what we started doing uh, about two years ago. We started recording the Creative Exponent and we talk about um, discovering, sharing, and upholding your creativity. So we do talk about creative business, but we talk about really just creativity in general. And it's been such a, it's just been such a fun, enriching experience. And we love interviewing people and other creatives and talking about how they started and where they came from and what they're up to. Um, it's just been one of those like life giving uh, parts of my job. <laughs> so um, yeah, you can, you can listen to it wherever you listen to podcasts. Just look up The Creative Exponent and you'll find it. And we'll include a link in the show notes. I want to hear all about your book, Feels Like Home. I've enjoyed going through the book. Beautiful photography. Thank you. Well, yeah, for people who are interested in decorating tips and tricks, um, this this book is really going to be right in your sweet spot. It's it's a decorating book, and it tells the story of this home, this suburban home, because when I did end up living in this 13-year-old house, I, as, as someone who shares my home online on a blog and on Instagram and YouTube and all that, 
I remember feeling like, gosh, people are going to be so disappointed that I'm not buying some like really awesome hundred year old farmhouse that they're going to get to follow this great journey of fixing it up. They're going to, I'm moving into a house that's like the one right next door in their neighborhood. (laughs) And so what I thought would be like a real disappointment ended up being this story that's very relevant. And I was hearing from people all the time of, oh my gosh, my kitchen is just like yours, or I can't wait to see what you do with this room because it's so similar to mine. And it really is such a very traditional, typical four square layout that you see in homes all over the United States. And so I realized it's really a very relevant story to share how to add character and to customize a home that's just very beige and basic and, you know, cookie cutter. It looks just like, you know, all the other homes in the neighborhood. So it it ended up being a great story. And that's what I wrote the book about is about taking this home that feels very generic and making it feel like your home, making it feel like you. So there are tutorials in the book and there's lots of tips and exercises and encouragement to get started. There's also just some fundamental decorating advice, like where to start and how to find your style, how to work with the style of your home instead of fighting with it. And, and also how to have um, contentment for your home as it is to not apologize for your home because it's an amazing blessing. So all of those themes are sprinkled through the book. Of course, there's a chapter on furniture too, because I do still love working on furniture, even though I don't (laughs) do it repeatedly all through the year. Uh, I'm still a furniture girl. And so there's there's, um, a chapter on furniture as well. Are there some pictures of some other homes in there? There are, yes. So... One of the main things, so of course, I wanted the book to be just a great book and encouraging. I wanted beautiful photos. I wanted it to be um, a nice size. So it could be a coffee table book and, um, and to have big, beautiful photos in it. But it was also important to me, since I do share my home online and on Instagram, it was important to me that the content would feel fresh, even to people who read my blog every single day. And that was going to be a challenge. So there are rooms that are in the book that have never been shared on my blog before. All the photography was specifically for the book. So it's all, you know, some rooms will look familiar, but it is all um, unique photography to the book. And then I also shot two local homes and I collaborated with a few of my friends on Instagram who did an amazing job with um, kind of cookie cutter homes and making them custom. So we cover everything from like really easy small changes to then a couple of rooms that were basically a gut job um, and then kind of everything in between. I think you ended up with a book that's more helpful to more people. I agree. And while I still look forward to the day when I can move into you know, some wonderful old home and give it a lot of love and and rescue it. That's really where my heart is when it comes to decorating and homes. This was a wonderful challenge and experience for me. And I have learned to really appreciate young homes in a new way (laughs) and to work on being a part of the story of making this house a great old house one day, you know, 80 years from now. I hope that this home is a great old home because of the things that we did to it. So it's given me a new appreciation, definitely, for newer homes. And, of course, it's great that, you know, all the wiring is new and the plumbing and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Although we did move into this house, like, right when everything was, like, hitting that uh, that age where it needed to be replaced. Everything was oh, original. No. So we still had all those not fun uh, purchases, like water heaters and uh, HVAC systems and stuff. But um, all in all... This has just been such a a delightful home to work on. And uh, um, yeah, so I share the full transformation in the book. Certainly go get this book and go check out what she did with this house. You've done a beautiful job with your home. Thank you. And the cool thing is it's really been just cosmetic changes. We have not ripped anything out or changed any, you know, moved any walls around. There's been no major construction. The the biggest project that we did um, that required the most, you know, demo and rebuilding was the bathroom, the master bathroom. And even then we didn't 
move things around. Everything remained in the same spot, but we did, um, you know, we redid the tile and stuff like that, which you see that in the, in the book. And I also talk about, um, you know, managing your own projects and things like that. But it, I like that we're not showing rooms that have been totally gutted on this, you know, $50,000 budget and redone. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's just like paint and changing out hardware and being thoughtful about the decoration and then splurging in a few places. So like in the, in the kitchen, we splurged on the counters and the appliances, which the appliances needed to be replaced anyway. So we were at that point where it's like, well, let's get them what we really, really want for this space. But other than that, it's just all cosmetic stuff that we did ourselves. So um, I think a lot of people will be able to relate to the book and it's going to feel very like accessible and attainable. Um, It's not, the rooms are not these high end, super expensive homes that are beautiful to look at and wonderful to read about. But then it's easy to walk away from those and feel a little disappointed, like, well, but I you know, I'm never going to be able to, to afford to do that. This, this book's very, very doable. One of the phrases that I saw in your book that really spoke to me was you mentioned telling your story by adding character. Mm. And I wanted you to explain that to us. What does that mean? Well, I think that when you're looking at a room and you're not sure where to go with it, where, where, how do I want to decorate this room? What I think is important to do is think about what is a life that I want to live in this room? Not so much what do I want it to look like, but what do, I, what do we want to do in this room? Because the life that you want to live in that room is going to inform your decorating decisions. If it's a place to you know, pile on the sofa and watch TV and build forts when there are snow days and play board games, that's going to let you know a lot, like how comfortable the seating needs to be, how much seating you need what the lighting needs to be like, that you need a place to put a TV where everybody can see it if they're sitting in those comfortable, you know, seats. And, you know, that you need a a table or a coffee table or a place to do those board games. So it can inform a lot about what you need and what the layout of the room is going to need. And then I think it can also inform a lot about the decor you add that's going to help tell that story and reinforce that story. So that when people walk in, they can immediately get a sense of the people who live there and what things they like and what they do. And um, I think that that's what really brings a room to life. We, you know, when you see a room in a catalog, that's what it's missing is who, who lives there <laughs> because it was mm-hmm. just styled to look beautiful. And while we all want our homes to look beautiful, ultimately, home is about a feeling. It's about what does what does the house feel like? What, does the, what do the rooms feel like? That's what I am really encouraging people to focus on and to capture in this book. Very well said. I think there's a danger with everybody sharing online what, you know, what they're eating or their house or whatever, that <laughs> it's easy to kind of make things about how they look. And that's great if you're taking a picture, but it's got to feel... It's got to feel like home. It's got to feel like a comfortable space that's yours in the end. So don't don't miss that by just focusing on what looks good. So don't put just French chairs in the room. Is that what you're telling me? (laughs) Oh, no. Always put French chairs in the room. (laughs) Always. (laughs) But maybe sometimes I just use them for books and then just a comfy chair to actually sit in next to it. Oh, it's so funny. As an aside on uh, Facebook Marketplace, just just earlier this week, I saw a listing that says, this is more of a looking chair, not a sitting chair. (laughs) And I was laughing because I'm like, yes, I've had looking chairs in my in my house before i'm like please don't sit on that it, i don't know if it will hold any weight at oh, all yeah. or the cane is gonna punch through or something but can't tell you how many times we had that experience here yes. yeah we had a few guys splat <laughs> oh boy well i mean so things can be decorative but it's like so i do have a couple of like barrel back antique cane chairs um but they're in my dining room where people are not they're not like at the dining
dining room table, they're flanking a buffet. So it's not in a place where people are going to be going and sitting. They're there more decoratively, whereas I'm not going to put that in our family room where we're watching movies or right up at a table where people are going to be sitting. So I think it's about, you know, it's about that balance of the the feeling and the function and then the aesthetic. Where can listeners find you, Marion? They can find me on, really, if they Google Miss Mustard Seed, they can find me. But my website is www.missmustardseed.com. And then on Instagram, they can find me at Miss Mustard Seed. I, I think you're everywhere, but those are probably the two best places to find you. Yeah, those are the best places to connect because from Instagram, you can follow my blog and go everywhere else. And then, of course, from my blog, it's linked to all the other social media platforms. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today, Marion. I just enjoyed this so much. You had lots of great advice. Oh, thank you, Anita, for having me. I really enjoyed it. Anita, I loved your interview with Marion. I learned so much about her, and I'm so inspired by much of what she said, particularly about being willing to try new things. Really wise words. And I'm going to encourage everyone to check out DTT on Vodacast, the podcast player, and see the links that we have included and the images of Marion's home. Now let's get into the DTT defines for today. Today we are defining the term Dado rail. Oh! <laughs> wow. Um, you know, a dado rail really most of the time is just a chair rail. Dado rail is a term used in the UK where we tend to use the word chair rail. But it's a little broader than that. So a dado rail, let me just define it, is a wooden railing or molding that's fixed horizontally along a wall, usually a third of the way up from the floor and it goes all the way around the room and it's to protect the wall from the back of the chairs when they're pushed up against the wall. Uh, So that's where it typically is and that's why we call it a chair rail. Dado rail can also refer to this rail that goes along the top of your ceiling right under your crown molding for hanging pictures. And I know that's what you have in your lovely Victorian house, Kelly. We do have that and I accidentally called it a chair rail in one of my YouTube videos. Well, I mean, Uh-oh. you would have thought I made the biggest mistake ever. People were commenting, that's not, boy, what a big chair she must have. <laughs> 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 but I wish I had called it a dado rail because then I wouldn't, no matter which I was referring to, I would have been right. Exactly. And maybe that's why they use that term because there's so many older homes there. They probably often have that railing up at the top as well. Whereas mm-hmm. the homes here in the U.S., we don't see that very often. Very true. Oh my gosh. Good to know. Wow. We're going to have all this kind of fun stuff to say at cocktail parties when we get to go to cocktail parties. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Go ahead. Clean out your closet. Then head straight to Quince. I love every item Quince offers from wardrobe to decor. And I can really recommend their ultra stretch super wide leg pant at forty nine ninety. The price is unbeatable and the look is so flattering. It keeps you in on top and flares out of the bottom. Everything feels right with Quince. The price, the quality, and the sustainability. Quince offers a range of luxury wardrobe and home goods at prices within reach. And like Quince's clothing, their home goods are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices, along with premium fabrics and finishes. Once you've cleaned out your closet and refreshed with quince, you can also add something to your home decor. So give your wardrobe and your home the refresh it needs with quince. Go to quince.com slash DTT to get free shipping and 365 day returns on your next order. That's quince, Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash DTT for free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash DTT. And let me know how you love those pants. Inevitably, with the new year, come wellness goals. One very effective and easy to reach goal is to add DOSE to your wellness regime. DOSE is expertly formulated organic wellness shots that support your liver in one delicious drink. Formulated with ingredients clinically shown to support liver health, potent turmeric, milk thistle, and ginger. There's zero sugar and zero calories. 
Did you know that your liver performs over 500 special functions? Since I learned all that my liver is doing, I started with Dose to support all those vital functions. I take a shot of refreshing Dose two times per week to combat everyday toxins from food, meds, alcohol, and unhealthy air. Since starting with Dose about a month ago, I am definitely feeling an overall improvement in my health. So if you want to give Dose a shot and invest in your health like I have, Dose is offering DTT listeners 15% off your first order, plus an additional 15% off if you subscribe for a monthly delivery. That's 30% off your first order. So go to dosedaily.co slash DTT and use the code DTT. That's dosedaily.co dot C-O slash DTT and use the code DTT. Well, what's your crush? Oh, so my crush is the pasted paper die cuts. I believe I have shared with everyone pasted paper. And I know I did the interview with Julie Campbell, the founder of the pasted paper. These die cuts are also one of her products. So the pasted paper are these individual wallpaper sheets that are really easy for a person to hang. You don't need a wallpaper person. She has some beautiful patterns. And one exciting thing I'd learned about from their Instagram was people are now using them as backsplashes, which I think is a brilliant idea and they can take a little water and all of that. But the die cuts is another aspect of the pasted paper business. And Laura and I were playing around with them at the end of the summer and doing some crafting and they are just so beautiful. So you can put them on little wooden boxes. You can embellish just about anything with them. You could even put them on a wall and do sort of make them like a mural sort of thing out of them. They're stunning. What about the back of a bookcase? Back of the bookcase would be great. So I'll put the link to pasted paper and don't just stop at looking at, at the wallpaper there. Dive in further and look at the die cuts and you can buy them in the sheets and they're just a wonderful thing to have in your craft stash or they might be a great thing if somebody wants to make DIY gifts for the holidays. It really looks professionally done when you add one of these beautiful die cuts. So check them out. This sounds wonderful because Evie has a cabinet. Actually, it's a 30s preacher's bar. But we've been using it to hide the TV, but her TV is not going to go in there. And she has no display space. So I think I'm going to put a shelf back in there. And this might be something beautiful to put in the back. And she can put her cute little little tchotchkes in there. Oh, this would be perfect on a piece of furniture like that. And, and that sounds like a really unique piece of furniture anyway. But even if you found something at a thrift store or state sale, and sure, you could paint it. But take it a step further. Try these die cuts on it. It, You know, it's just really beautiful. So I think it really would enhance that. Go for it. Try it in Evie's and let us know how it goes. Oh, I, I think I'm going to. What's your crush? My crush today is a new type of tea that I really didn't have much experience with. I saw it and it was in a little sampler set of four cute little tins of loose tea. Well, I couldn't turn that down. Uh, It's Wittered. Have you heard of that brand before? I don't think so. W-H-I-T-T-A-R-D. It's a UK brand. No, I don't think I've seen that. We had Evie's Sunday school class here recently for a tea. And I mean, we got out the silverware, the linen napkins, the crystal stems, all the good stuff. And I used this tea to serve the girls and it was really delicious. Oh, beautiful. What, What a fun event. It was so fun, and they had so much fun. They were dressed up. They were wearing hats, fancy oh, dresses. Oh, I love it. They were such lovely guests, so it was very fun. And I got to try this new tea that was really very delicious. I'll include a link where you can buy it. And it was it was very good. It was very good. You know, I don't like tea that's bitter, and this is a very smooth flavor. Well, uh, thanks to you, everybody really has... I augmented their tea <laughs> choices, right? <laughs> right. I mean, we, we could do a whole list of your tea crushes and try them all. Wouldn't that be fun if we could have a DTT tea party? That would be a blast. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm up. I'm up for that. Well, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. So we could pretend we had a tea party. Remember, we're here to inspire you to create a beautiful home. Until next time. Want to talk to us? Well, we really want to talk to you. 
So let's schedule a design consult. And Nita and I are here to give you individualized, actionable advice on how to create the beautiful home you want and deserve. It's so easy to schedule a design consult with us. Simply click the link in the show notes or head to decoratingtipsandtricks.com slash consult. When we talk to you on the scheduled time, we will be ready with so many great tips, advice, and yes, tricks. So sign up today for a design consult. We can't wait to talk to you.